Great. All right. Um, any questions before we get started? Going once, going twice. Great. All right. Easy enough. Um, one uh, quick update on the um, assignment. Uh, just real easy. There's a mention of NAX in the grading of RDT 3.0. Um, I went back to the book. One of you pointed this out to me. Uh, there are no NAX in RDT 3.0, so we will not be we will not be grading you guys on that. Um, so if you have NAX in RDT 3.0, great. It's nothing you need to change. If you don't have NAX in RDT 3.0. You don't need to implement them. Um, just a, just an error in the grading rubric. All right, I think that will uh, hopefully wrap up the RDT 3.0 kind of uh, redo. Thank you all for submitting the comments and so I can make those changes. Um, all right, cool. So let's get to the lecture. So um, we're going to introduce um, the next program assignment. I don't think we're quite there yet. I um, might do it on, on Wednesday. Um, so today we'll talk about um, routing. Uh, if you guys see lightning behind me, that is because there's this massive storm going on right now. So I'm kind of crossing my finger. We'll keep power. Uh, so we'll ho hopefully that will happen. Okay, so um, we talked about um, datagram networks, uh, which is basically packet switching and forwarding. And um, now we're getting a little bit more into, into routing, and we talked about IP. So I wanted to show you guys a little more detail on how routing tables or how forwarding tables and routers are, are actually constructed or what they actually look like. Okay, um, so the basic goal of this is to keep um, the routing tables as small as possible. Why do we want that? Well, one, we want to keep many routes in memory, potentially, um, because there are many different destinations in the internet, so we want to have a compact representation of those routing tables. Um, and if the routing tables are small, um, they can be put into the sort of hardware memory at, um, at the um, interfaces, at the router interfaces at the input and output ports, and then we can do forwarding in uh, memory. So um, we can think of the routing table as looking like something like this for a certain set of um, IP addresses will be routing to a certain interface. Now, the problem with this is that we're still keeping kind of two numbers, the sort of from and to IP address, um, as well as the interface we're going we're going out of. So we'd like to reduce this to be to be even less, uh, to take even less storage. All right. So let me get my pointer. Okay. Cool. So we can think of a routing table as essentially something like this. Um, we have some IP address. So this is a starting IP address, right? We have the four bytes, and we're going to route anything with a destination address between this and this through interface zero, this and this through interface one, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe we can have something like otherwise routed through interface two, perfectly fine. Okay. We can notice this though, that there is some overlap between these addresses, right? The from and to, because IP addresses represent a range, um, there will be a prefix in that, in that range, okay? So anything that starts with one, one, zero, zero, et cetera, et cetera, through, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Um, after that, we have zeros, and after here, we have ones, okay? So you can think of it as basically anything that starts with this prefix is going to go through interface zero, okay? Easy enough. Now, instead of storing two numbers, we can really just store one number, all right? Um, same thing can go for this routing rule and this routing rule. Now, you'll notice, though, that this routing rule um, is more specific or um, has some overlap with this routing rule. Okay, so basically, um, 
you can say, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, so you can say that these have a common prefix up through um, 0, 0, 0, 11, and then they diverge here at 1. Okay, so this routing rule is more specific um, than this routing rule. So you can basically then have, for the more specific rule, a longer prefix. Okay, and the way that the matching, the match plus plus action works, which is basically how when an incoming packet uh, comes to a, a specific face, how it's going to be routed, depends on um, the router trying to find the longest prefix for its destination. Okay? So it'll basically look through this table, say, do we match this rule? Do we match this rule? Do we match this rule? But if the packet starts with um, basically this prefix, 00011, it will try, the router will try to see if there's a longer match for um, this uh, for the packet's destination address, and if so, it will try to find the longest match for the most specific rule. Now, you can translate this into, uh, okay, how about a change in slide? Yes, thank you. Okay, you can translate this to um, side representation or um, or basically to the IP to and from. And then, because these are prefixes, you can also make this translation where the routing rule is actually anything going through this subnet. Okay, so this prefix, these are the bits we care about, and this is happens to be slash 21. Anything with this IP address in the, or basically in the subnet in the slash 21 network will go out into phase zero. Okay, anything with this prefix to a slash 24 network, because this is more specific, Okay, so we have a longer kind of set of bits that have been specified. We'll go out into phase one. And then this less specific um, subnet will be matched through a slash 21 um, address that happens to have kind of the same uh, prefix here, right? So this is dot 24. Okay, so they both have 24. But because of these zeros, we can get, we can specify these zeros as, as meaningful with a slash 24, thereby creating a longer prefix and then having a more specific match packets that match the specific longer prefix going on into phase one. Okay. So we basically reduce the requirements for storage in, uh, in the router to an IP address and a subnet number or a subnet mask. And that brings us to the control plane, which is where a lot of fun stuff happens because this is where routing happens. Um, so what we want to do is to route from a source, which we'll label this as source, to the destination, which we'll label this. Now, what we actually want to route, um, or how we want to route in this network, is not between the source node and the destination node, but between the source router and the destination router. Um, so routing happens between routers. These routers will participate in some routing protocol, and there will be a path from the source router to the destination router, which will then know to forward the data to its connected hosts. Okay. So to be more specific, we're routing between subnets. Um, or but at this level of abstraction, you can think of it as as routing between um, routers. Okay. So um, if this is our first top router, and this is our last top router, or the destination router, and this is the network. Okay, how would you define the best path in this network, or a good path in this network? Would it depend on the most? Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. It may have missed it, but what are the the weights? Are those Costs as in bad, or like cost as in um, speed? That's a good question, right? So there is something you can measure, and I'm not, I'm not telling you, I guess, what this is. Well, technically, I am telling you it's cost here. Okay, but um, it's a, it's a good, it's a good question, right? What about this network can actually be measured? Yeah, I mean, you can. I mean, there's there's algorithms for like max flow that you could apply to figure out where you could get the most like bandwidth, I guess, right? 
mm -hmm. data across with that. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you want two things, right? First, as you're pointing out, or as you're asking, you need to understand what type of metric we can have in this network. Okay? So what would be, what do you guys think could be reasonable metrics? A metric for how fast you can get data to the endpoint that you want, and then, sure. okay, yep, like, and then like an overall capacity, like, it might be a longer path, but you know, if you can get, if the amount of data you can transfer at once is higher, then it might overall be better. Mm -hmm. Right, like if you have a really thin pipe that goes a short distance, but then you have a really long, huge pipe that goes a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So those are those are very good points, right? You, you can sort of think of this as um, the kind of the simple problem of getting one packet from the source to the destination where you don't have to deal with capacity. And then you can make the problem more uh, global and more holistic by looking at the capacity of the network, right? Understanding that you may not be able to get everything on the fastest possible path. There is some load balancing that might need to be um, included in this. But for now, we'll just look at it as, we'll assume there's enough capacity on these links, or basically maybe let's look at it differently. We'll assume there's only one packet being routed. Or one Could you also routed. measure um, like the number of dropped packets or um, the number of corrupted packets from certain links and stuff like that and take that into account? Or would that be, would that be a, an issue? Um, it's a good idea. So you have some metric of reliability, right? Um, so, okay, what does it mean for, if, if you have a good path, right, what would you, what would you consider to be a good path from a source to a destination? Or a bad path? Uh, good reliability um, and good speed and a solid connection, I guess. How would you measure speed? Um, just basically how much data, how many bytes you're getting through. Um, so throughput. Consistently, yeah, so throughput. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so you can measure throughput. You can measure latency. Okay. You can measure uh, things like cost as well, right? If you're the network operator, you may actually care more about cost than flow performance. Okay. So basically, you can look at these different types of metrics or consider these different types of metrics when choosing a path or you can consider a combination of these metrics to find some balanced path, right? Or you can go a step above and, and, and start worrying about overall capacity and load balancing and things like that. Okay. Um, so the algorithms, the routing algorithms basically assume that there is some metric given to them, right? How you define that metric or what makes a good path is requires some value judgment and often a perspective. From us, we just want the fastest, biggest capacity pipe. Right. I mean, before Corona, I wanted to have low latency paths. Now I'll just settle for sufficient bandwidth. <laughs> right. Whereas for like an operator perspective, they just want uh, something that basically costs the least while their customers are relatively happy. Um, so they have a different objective. All right. So once we have some set of some metrics, we can define these as kind of cost. Right. And then we want to let's say minimize cost. Okay. If these if these things were um, capacity or throughput on these links, we would want to maximize that. Well, maximization turns out is kind of the going, going in the wrong direction. So what we'll probably do is find the inverse of those uh, values if, if those were capacity and then try to minimize the inverse of capacity. And so generally we're talking about the minimizing of a path cost. Um, and then you can define the cost in terms of whatever metric you want that makes sense to minimize. All right. So um, how would we find the least cost path between U and Z? Okay. So if you had a global knowledge of links, right? If, you, if this were possible, what would you do? What would be your approach? So are these, is this going to be kind of like one of those algorithms that we learned in 
uh, was it 232 using one of the like uh, graph algorithms like yes. Dijkstra's or Dijkstra. Uh, Dijkstra is exactly right. Okay, cool. Yep. <laughs> Thanks for seconding Dijkstra. It's the way to go. Um, so you can you can get more complicated things when it comes to load balancing, but if you just want to pass, Dijkstra is great. Um, and um, this runs into problems though when your network becomes very large. Right? You need to collect global state, which if it takes a while for you to, let's say this is the size of the internet, right? And you're sitting here, it might take a very long time for you to learn about link costs in the neighborhood of Z. Right? By the time you get those, these actually might have changed. And so you're computing a path that is, you know, your information isn't even from the same time period. So you're really computing a path that might not have even existed at any point in time. And so for large networks, this is difficult. For small networks, this works very well. Um, interestingly, this is also the, the approach can, used in uh, software-defined networks, which we'll be um, talking about later. Right. Um, so this type of approach is called link state. There is, you collect the state of all the links, and then you compute um, the path through between any source and any destination. So this is Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, probably can assume that all of you guys would have seen it by now. Um, and the way this works is basically as follows. You have, let me talk about initialization, initialization actually. So we have some set of nodes, um, N, and then we're computing a set, or we're collecting a set N prime, which initially will comprise of U because that's where we want to compute the paths from. And then for any node, V that is adjacent to you, we're going to send set the distance to V as the cost from U to V. So basically the link cost on the next on the next hop. Okay. So we can see this in this table. In step zero, our n prime is going to contain U because we're starting at this node. <clears throat> and then for every other node in here, we're going to compute the distance to this to this node if we know it. So from U, our distance to V is going to be two, okay, just basically the cost of this link. And we can say that we can get to V through U, right? Which is basically this, right? So the path to V is U. Now the path to W is going to be cost of five and we're going to W through U. So all of these are going to have U. Path to X is one. And then path to Y and path to Z are basically unknown. These are not our neighbors. Uh, or these are not used neighbors. And so we're going to set the cost of this to infinity. In the next iteration, what happens is you find um, the node with the lowest cost. Okay, so out of these, this is going to be X. Okay? And so we're gonna take X and we'll add it to uh, the set of N prime nodes. Okay? And now we can update these costs for paths going through X. Okay? So our path to V is not going to be any cheaper. Okay, we compare this price of what we have to the path from us to x and from x to v. And so the path through x is going to be three, so we don't need to update this, but the path to w, instead of taking five, now it's going to take four, one plus three. And so we can update our path, our cost to w as four, going through x. Our path to y um, can now be added because we can get to y through x and so the cost is two, the path is through x, we, z is still unreachable. Okay? And then we look at this and we pick the lowest cost uh, node. Let's say we got two candidates, v and y. Let's say we take y and now we add y to n prime and we repeat this process. And we keep repeating, keep repeating. Okay, so at the end of the day, we end up with this table. Next slide, there we go. Um, okay, so we have the cost, but we don't actually have the path. How would we compute the path to Z using this table? Basically, need to trace this back. 
Okay, so we know that our cost to Z is going to be four. That's great. We know what the cost is. And now we know that to get there, um, the previous half is going to be Y. Okay, so then um, we need to go now through Y. How do we get to Y? Okay, our path, the path to Y leads through X. Okay, and then we know that X is um, directly connected to us because we get to it through U. Right, so now our path becomes U, X, Y, Z. Right? So we sort of read backwards through this table. And that is Dijkstra. Super easy. But to do this, you do need to know all the all the link costs, which may be difficult to collect in large networks. All right, so what can we do? Um, so that's link state. All right, now what if we have kind of a different assumption about this network, all right? We're gonna assume that each node doesn't know everything about this, about doesn't have the knowledge of the global topology, but it still wants to get send packets to any destination. So a node X, some node X, um, will only know the cost uh, between X and V, assuming V are all its one-hop neighbors, or any of its one-hop neighbors. And so each node knows the cost to its neighbors, um, and it can also advertise the cost of reaching any destination in this network. Right? So you do need to know all the destinations, um, or at least for those you know of, you can advertise the cost, the cost to them. Right? So uh, we're going to assume that the cost or the distance from um, to y from x is going to be dx y. Right? And however we compute it, we can advertise it. So how would you go about figure, building a routing algorithm to, to do this? I can give you a hint. If you ever bought anything, um, if you ever bought anything illicit in your life, or you know someone who has, the process might go like something like, "Well, I don't know how to get the thing I want, but I know somebody who has a connection to somebody who has a connection to somebody else, <laughs> right?" And that's basically the idea. You don't know how to get to the thing you want to get to, but you know somebody who has, right? And that's kind of what. Um, uh, the Bellman Ford equation does. Right? So you can compute the distance to any destination okay, as your distance to somebody plus their distance to the destination. So as long as you get this advertisement um, and you know the cost to where you're getting the advertisement from, you can compute your cost to the destination. Right? So if you hear from multiple people, multiple Vs in this case, you can figure out, okay, this person is a good connection for me and that person is not, right? Or this person is a better connection for me. All right, um, so this is called distance vector routing. It's another approach. Um, I, have, I have a quick question. Sure. So do these costs ever change or are costs between routers pretty, um, pretty stable for the most part? That is a great question. Um, it depends on the metric. Okay. Right. So think about metrics such as hop count. Right? If we're doing routing in the internet, which we'll get to when we talk about VGP, um, the primary metric is basically hop count. And it's not even hop count on links, it's hop count through other ISPs. Right? If you remember back to um, the way internet is structures, structured, basically data gets forwarded from big dog, you know, from like small fish ISPs to big fish ISPs. Mm -hmm. Right, and so right. you can compute the cost and basically how many intermediaries there are, how many hubs there are, or how many other companies you're going through. So the metric that ISPs would use is something like hub count through other ISPs, and that is very unlikely to change on any fast basis. Right, um, the only time that would change is if there's some new 
relationship between um, ISPs or in some cases, if a link goes down. All right, so that's a fairly stable routing metric. Okay. If you pick some other routing metric, what would be like the least stable metric you can think of? The least stable? The least stable metric. I'm not too uh, sure. Really. The least stable the metric least is congestion. Stable. Oh throughput, yeah, yeah. Throughput, yeah, pretty good. Throughput, yeah. yeah, you guys are getting there, right? Because that yeah. changes all the time. Every single packet that you get is going to change your level of congestion or, the, or you know, maybe not even the level of congestion, but the size of queues, right? That's something you can measure uh, precisely, right? And that'll, so, yeah, that'll depend on how fast it can get those packets out too. Right. So, okay, yeah, that would make sense. Okay. Right, so if, if you want to pick a, pick a path that has the shortest queue length, cumulative queue length, right? Mm -hmm. Great. The moment you find a path and you start routing on it, that will become then, pretty much the worst path. Right, because it, it it's always going to be the one that the computer wants to go to to send things through because it's the one that has the smallest queue. So does everybody's connection go to the one that has the smallest queue, which causes that to have more congestion? It, it would. That's exactly right. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so routing based on congestion doesn't doesn't really work very well. No. Um, right. Or, or well, let me put it this way: it is too unstable to really use in a in a in a in a large network. Um, there's actually some some other problems with it, but you get the idea. It's it's very unstable. Um, right. So when you think of latency, well, latency is a little trickier, right? You know, do you include few lens or not? Do you just include the, the you know the kind of the capacity of the link times the uh, uh, kind of its length, right? You can look at it that way too. So there's there's some metrics that are more stable than others, but the cost can change periodically because things get disconnected because I don't know there is something that happens to a connection. If it's like a wireless connection, you can have um, interference, whatever. When this changes, right? You need to now change. Um, uh, you need to advertise the different cost. Okay. So let's say that we're routing from U, X, Y, Z. Okay, well, now let's say that this cost changes to like 10. Okay, so now um, basically instead of advertising from Y advertising its cost to Z as two, now it needs to advertise it as six, right? One plus five. Okay, so that goes, that advertisement gets sent out here. Now X says, okay, I can no longer reach Z in three, I can reach it in seven. Okay, so this gets advertised. So basically, it's possible that a change in cost will will result in a chain reaction throughout this network of updates uh, by creating updates. Right, like if you know the cost of producing socks in China changes, all of a sudden everyone that resells those socks. So you can buy them, so we can buy them in the States, is going to be updating their prices. It's kind of one way of looking at it, right? Like, you know, if you read the news article that the price of cotton went up in China, like you're not actually going to see that price until it kind of propagates through the supply chain to Costco. Um, all right, Adam, that's the greatest analogy. I'll work on it. All right, so here's the, oh wait, any other questions? Any other questions before I move on? Okay, so um, so this is the distance vector algorithm, um, which basically there's two parts to it, all right? First, we're going to build this table, which is at node X. Um, we're going to have a cost to all the destinations we know about from all the neighbors we know about. Okay, in this network, this is basically a network in which everyone is both a destination and a neighbor, right? There's everyone's connected to everybody else. Um, so this ends up being a symmetric matrix um, or a square matrix. But um, what you have is a cost to all the destinations, and then what um, your uh, rows are basically your number of, of uh, neighbors. Okay, so initially we know our cost to, um, if we're at X, Okay, we know our cost to x is zero, we know our cost to y is two, and, our, and we know that our direct link costs 
here to z is seven. So that's what we can put in our row. We don't know at this point what is the cost from y to z, for example, and we don't know what is the cost from z to anything either. So we're just going to leave those as infinity. Okay? So that's basically the, the setup. And now when we do get a distance vector from somebody else, basically someone else sends, our, sends us their table or really um, their row, um, we can um, update our costs through by transiting through them. And let me show you an example. If this moves. Yes, okay. So we have our network on the right and we have our tables here on the left. So node X has tables, has its cost to the destinations, node Y has its cost to the destinations, right? So from Y we can get to X at cost two, to Z at cost one, and to Y itself at cost zero, right? And the same is true for node Z. Now, those nodes will start exchanging their information. All right, so let's look at node Y. Node Y receives this update from node X, okay? And now node Y knows that X can reach X at cost zero, it can reach Y at cost two, and it can reach Z at cost seven. How does it know it? Well, because it got this information from X. And the same is true for node um, Z. Uh, by sending its information to node Y, uh, node Y can update this row in the table. Okay, but something else happens. Um, a more interesting thing happens at, the other with the other tables at the other nodes. So here we have node y, uh, sorry, node x, which receives information from node y and from node z. Okay, so we can basically fill this information in here. Now it can also look at whether or not its costs have been reduced by a transitive connection. Okay, so um, by iterating through its destinations, it can do the the following. It can compute its cost the cost from x of reaching z, okay, which is going back to um, this part of the algorithm. What we have is we want to compute the distance through any v um, to starting from x through any v to some y. Okay? So we have uh, basically the cost of from x to x and the distance from x to z is one candidate okay? and then the other candidate is the cost from x to y and the distance from y to z those are kind of the two ways of getting to z in this network we either go directly through x or we go through y okay? so we can compute this that the cost of reaching x from x is zero and the cost of reaching z from x is seven and similarly, the cost of reaching y through from x, okay, the cost of reaching y from x is 2. And the cost of reaching y, z from y, the cost of reaching z from y is 1. And we can add those two together. This ends up being 3. This ends up being 7. So the minimum of that is 3. And we can update the fact that the, the distance from x to z is 3. And now this is what um, x can advertise that, hey, I can reach z at cost 3. Right? It doesn't tell anybody through whom, um, but it just knows what the cost, um, that it can advertise its cost to somebody else. Right? And then finally, when, when this 3 is computed and uh, symmetrically this 3 is computed on node z, they can exchange this information again now because they would do that because their costs in the tables have been lowered to what, from what they have been before. And um, this can be entered symmetrically um, at these nodes and here and here. Yeah, so that's basically distance vector. Question? Yeah, I was just kind of curious. This might just be a bit semantical um, or kind of silly, but um, yeah. Wouldn't they always know that a link to itself would be a cost of zero, or is that uh, not an assumption we can make? It, it it absolutely can be. Yeah, I'm being uh, I'm being very explicit about this, but yeah, they can. You know, uh, they do know that. Yeah. Okay. So this keeps track of the weights. Um, 
Mm-hmm. It, does it also keep track of the route? Um, yeah. I can it backtrack like Dextra's where it backtracks through the routing or? Um, it would, yeah, let me see how it would do it. It would, yes. So here's how, here's how it would work, right? So at node X, you want to reach, um, yeah, sure. Let's go look at this one. At node X, you want to reach some destination Z, right? So you could go um, ba, 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 ba. Um, you would look at Okay, so you know your cost is three. Would it pretty much just have to recalculate the minimum? Yeah, so, I'm trying. Yeah, I think I don't think you get this from the stable. I think you would have to uh, just basically keep track of how you of of how you got that three. Um, okay, so it doesn't inherently keep track of the routing. I feel like I feel like it should, but I don't I don't see how it could, unless I'm missing something. Because you just know what your cost is. Um, so you can advertise it. Um, so when you're getting this update, so you know that the cost of reaching. Yeah, okay, you do know, you do know this. Uh, so the cost of reaching Z from U is three, but from Y is one okay so you know that you can't get to z through z okay so this so this goes out the window right you know that your cost is three so you can advertise it okay but then you can look at your cost to z through this and basically say okay i can't use z because of this nation i can't use myself because that makes no sense and i can basically see which of my neighbors has advertised the lowest distance to that Okay. okay. Um, so then I guess you can go back and see if this makes sense by looking, um, you know, by looking into your table, what is your cost of reaching Y? Yeah, so I guess you would have to, I guess you do have the information, you would just have to figure out kind of this, just do the sum of this plus your row to figure out which is actually the best path. Cool, thank you. Cool, thanks for, thanks for asking, good question. All right. Okay, so there's a um, couple weird things that happen in um, in this in distance vector networks. Okay, so let's say that we have this network, and um, this cost goes from four to one. Okay, so cool. Now we have a decrease. So let's look at the sequence of events that happens. So first, a time instant t one. Why? Okay, let's say notices that its cost um, changes, okay, and updates its distance vector. Okay, so the cost of reaching X in this case. Okay. Um, cool. So at time two, so, okay, so Y updates its distance vector and sends an update. Okay, at time two, Z would get Y's distance vector and change its cost of reaching X to two. Okay, so now Y says, hey, I can reach X and one. Z says, cool, I can reach Y and one. So my cost becomes two and not five. Okay. 
Um, and then y will receive z's distance vector and make no change of its own, right? It, it, z would advertise, hey, I can reach x and 2. y says, I'm not interested in that. I can reach x and 1. So there is no further minimum being computed in this table for y. And so the algorithm stops, right? There's no more updates. No cost went down further, and so we're done. Okay. But what happens, on the other hand, when your link cost increases? Okay. So we have this going from 4 to 60, and this going from 5 to 50. What do you think the algorithm would do in this case? Or let me ask differently. How many steps would it take for the algorithm to stop sending updates? Would it be five? I don't know if they can change in parallel. Um, mm -hmm. Like if a T1, one, one um, Y notices the option updates, um, then then a T2, at the same time, a T1, C also changes the update, but on the other end, and then T2, C um, the updates Y, but it sends, but then Y, to also proceed to the update coming from Z, or kind of getting mm -hmm. on the loss, but that's yeah. my path process. Yeah, you have a good intuition. Definitely be more than three, right? Um, but it's actually a lot more, okay? So here's what happens. Y notices that its cost went up significantly, okay? So Y look in, looks into its routing table and says, hmm, the direct link is bad, um, but looks like I have a good path that Z recently advertised, right? Because Z said that its path of reaching, its cost of reaching X happens to be six, okay? So I says, okay, cool. I can't get to X directly anymore at a low cost, but it looks like I can get to X through Z at cost six. Sweet, I'm gonna advertise that, okay? And now Z gets that update, okay? And Z says, well, my cost is very high, but thankfully Y is advertising a cost of six. So awesome, I'm gonna send my data through Y, okay? And it's gonna advertise the cost of getting to Y as one plus whatever Y advertises. So it advertises cost as seven, okay? Now Y receives that update and says, okay, well, it looks like my path is still through Z, but it's not as good as before because Z says it's not six anymore, it's now, um, seven, so I'm going to update my cost to eight, right? And they're basically counting up ultimately to 50, <laughs> right? So this will take about 50 rounds to, to settle. Does that make sense? They're all kind of, both of them are counting on each other as being a better destination, whereas both of them are uh, bad, they just don't know about it. So lowering costs, easy, raising costs, in some scenarios, potentially hard. Okay, so we can get around the situation by something called Poison Reverse. Okay? And the way we can get around the situation is if Z knows that it's routing through X to X through Y. Okay? So initially the costs are four and five, and let's say um, Z chooses this path through Y to get to X. So it advertises its cost of reaching X as infinity, but just when sending its routing table to Y. Okay, to basically make sure that Y doesn't think that Z has a better path through Y than Y has directly to X. Okay. So at time T1, Y will notice, Y will notice that the cost has changed and update its distance to X to 60. Okay, because it has a choice of 60 on a direct link or infinity 
going through Z. Okay. So at that point, it will advertise this change and Z um, receives this update of Y's vector, but it will keep its cost now at 50. Right? Well, the cost through Y is no longer five, so I guess 50 is better than 60. Okay. But now Z is routing directly to X, so it doesn't need to poison the reverse path to Y. So it will advertise 50 to Y. And now Y can look at that and say, okay, cool. Well, my direct cost is 60, but I can get to Z by cost one. So my path to X has a distance of one plus 50. All right, so just like a little trick of if you're writing through somebody, uh, make sure they don't route through you. And the way you can do that in distance vector is to poison the reverse path from them to you by setting its cost as infinity. All right. And um, that's basically how you solve the count to infinity problem, but the solution will not work for um, kind of bigger loops, right? Uh, bigger loops are a little more difficult to discover and get rid of. Um, but that's kind of one of the reasons we have time to live so that packets don't get stuck around being bounced around between Y and Z while the routing paths are being um, settled down. So while it's poisoned, say it got reduced again and became a viable link, um, X would just have to update that and then basically advertise that to Y so that Y would unpoison it or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yes. So if if Z decides that it's not routing through Y, it doesn't have to poison that path. Did I, did I get your scenario right or, or did I answer the wrong example? Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just curious on, um, so say a link actually does get back to like a viable um, cost and, you know, say X to Y goes to four again and it becomes okay, the okay. better path, um, but Y has already poisoned that link. Um, X would just re-advertise its links or its like cost status and then Y would like depoison it or? Yes, yes. So if the cost Y to X became low again, okay, Y would realize that it's now routing directly and not through Z. So if it had poisoned the reverse to Z, it would now say, hey Z, I have, a, here's my new distance vector. And since I'm not routing through you, um, I'm not setting the cost 2x at infinity, you can route through me. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. So kind of in summary, we, you can look at these two approaches and um, use them in different settings. Okay. So link state is centralized in the sense that a node wanting to route becomes kind of the center of this algorithm and computes the path for itself, right? So it's it's uh, uh, kind of distributed in the sense that every node does it for itself. It doesn't need to be necessarily a central server, um, but each node becomes kind of its own server collecting all the information. It is also synchronous or kind of it should be in that a node needs to have all the information that is current before it can make a decision. In practice, that can be difficult to, to achieve. Distance vector is distributed. Um, all the nodes don't need to know everything about this network, and it is asynchronous um, because the updates are just kind of sent when a cost drops, there is an or, or when a cost changes, there is an advertisement of a different of a different cost. Okay. Um, when you're reasoning about these approaches, you can see that um, um, link state is basically on the order of um, the set of uh, vertices and the set of edges, right? To do link state, you basically need to describe what this network looks like. Um, and so it's kind of this order of message of messages, number of, of messages sent, okay? Um, it's a little harder to quantify the message complexity of um, distance vector, right? The exchanges are between neighbors only, and then a, a link cost change might propagate through the network. It might have, on the other hand, very little difference where uh, it just changes how one node forwards to on some pass segment, um, but it actually, the change that happens in one part of the network doesn't actually need to propagate to the rest of the network because it makes no change 
beyond kind of its local its local area. Um, and so it's a little harder to quantify what you know what what a change does. Um, if there are no changes, then you know you really just need to communicate the set of um, I guess the set of uh, I guess each node needs to know something about how, about each destination, right? So here is the complexity of the graph. Um, here is the complexity of things that people are routing to, which kind of depends on traffic pattern, right? Difficult to difficult to estimate. Okay, the speed of convergence um, for link state, it's n log n. It's basically has to do with sorting. Um, and for distance vector, the convergence time will vary, right? It depends on the routing loops. It depends on, you know, there's a change. Did the link calls go up or down? Can you use Poisson reverse or not? Um, difficult to analyze depends on the pattern of changes in that, in that network. Okay. So... Um, here's what can happen when a router malfunctions, right? So this is this is something that, that happens, links go up or down, um, they can advertise incor incorrect link costs. This is something we'll talk about when we talk about BGP, all the different BGP poisoning attacks where uh, some dictatorial country decides to steal all Google traffic for a little while, right? This can, this can happen. Um, so under link state, a node can basically advertise the wrong link cost, but each node that receives that can make its own decision, right? So if you see some router saying, hey, I have like a really great way of getting to this destination, you're free to make the decision on your own. You say, uh, no, I'm not gonna believe that router. Whereas in distance vector, you don't really know who made the change necessarily because you're just getting information from your neighbor saying, hey, I can get to this destination for at a lower cost. Right? And so you don't know what information they are relying on. Um, and so it's much easier to actually for errors to propagate through through a, a distance vector network. Okay? What we'll see in practice is that link state works really well for small networks, um, data center networks, kind of local campus networks, things like that. Um, but once you get to a bigger network like the internet, there's really no way of running link state. You need to you need to do distance vector. And we'll see distance vector basically not even at the granularity of links, but at the granularity of ISPs um, when we talk about BGP. All right, I think that does it for today. Any final questions? Yeah, so would the idea then be when they're rerouting the traffic like that um, by like poisoning links stuff, is that just to basically intentionally hurt the network, uh, just slow it down, or is that to actually like gain access in some way? Yeah, good good question. Um, there's two like two major reasons for this. One is to block traffic to certain sites. Um, you can basically black hole traffic where I don't know. Uh, there was an issue with Pakistan, that's the one I'm remembering right now, where they basically wanted to block YouTube. Um, this was a big deal when it happened. I think it's been kind of more common in different countries. Um, Belarus, most recently. Um, the other thing that, that Russia has been doing is basically stealing Google traffic for a while, like an hour. And what people think that they're doing is they can't really decrypt it right now, but uh, they might be able to decrypt it in like 20 years or 10 years. Right? And some kind of state secrets are longer lived than that. So they're capturing traffic in order to basically mothball it until they can decrypt it. Clever. Wow, interesting. <laughs> so would that be like hoping that they ever get to, you know, quantum computing or like something that they could actually like break a hash or is that is that just... I, I, I don't know. But yeah, I, that seems reasonable to me. <laughs> yep. All right, I see um, you guys leaving, which is great. Uh, lecture's over. So if you're here, say present um, one more time, or if you haven't already, uh, if you have any other questions, uh, shoot. Thanks. All right, thanks guys.
Um, I had I had a quick question. If you have a minute, sure. So, with um, distance vectors, are is there actually a connection between um, like neighbor nodes? If that makes sense. Um, or is there like uh, so? Like, if yeah. if one yeah. one node updates its cost to one of its neighbors, mm -hmm. um. Are they in constant contact with each other? I guess is what I'm asking. Or do they just? Is it like um, TCP where it just like sends requests essentially? Um, so in 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 distance vector, the the rule is that when your cost changes, you send an update about it. Um, right. In practice, there are permanent connections between neighboring routers when we talk about something like BGP. Okay. Right. So, so routers will connect with each other, and they'll hold on to these connections as long as they are physically connected. Oh, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. You're welcome.